I started by thanking Steve for his personal story, which in many ways uh, has been the experience of Palestinians, that the whole state of Israel and the whole Zionist project was built on totally denying the existence or legitimacy of the Palestinian people. We're told there's no such thing as Palestinians. It was a land without a people for a people without a land. Uh, and yet the Palestinian people exist, and they exist in their millions. And while they don't have much political power or military power, there is no denying their existence in that land, their love for that land, and their connection with that land. Now, on the map, you will see a, uh, a map of Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. Uh, as it relates to the rest of the Middle East, you have Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. Uh, this map is important to keep in mind, to remind us that Israel, Palestine, has always been right in the middle between Asia, here, Europe, and Africa. And so over years, uh, almost all the empires of the known world went through that area, conquered it, occupied it, lost it, uh, reconquered it. So there were many people who can trace their history back to here, not just the Jewish uh, people. And the people, the Palestinian people who are living there, if I can get another map, if we go back about a century, for example, all of Palestine was Arab, fully populated by Arabs. Now, about 5 or 10 percent of them were of the Jewish faith. And about 10 or 15 percent were like myself, of the Christian faith with its many denominations. And the rest were of the Muslim faith. But they all thought of themselves as Arab. They all spoke Arabic, ate Arabic food, liked Arabic music, dressed as Arabs, and considered themselves to be Palestinian Arabs and were hoping for basically freedom, independence, and self-determination. They really had no idea what was happening in Europe at that time. And what was happening is very important to remember. What was happening was that the Christian Europeans, Western Europeans, were living out a very evil, evil ideology called anti-Semitism. They really hated Jews as Jews. There were religious, economic, and cultural reasons for it. They uh, blamed them for their problems. They blamed them for killing Christ. They blamed them for not accepting him as Messiah. And they really felt it was okay and proper, maybe even their duty as Christians, to really be very hateful towards Jews. And so the Zionist movement started by saying, Jews have to deal with this anti-Semitism. How do we deal with it? We set up a Jewish state. And when we set it up, it doesn't matter. We can set it up anywhere, but what better place than to set it up in our historic homeland? Yeah. And I'm not going to deny for one second that Jews have a connection to Palestine and to Jerusalem just like Muslims have a connection to Mecca and Saudi Arabia, but they don't have every right to go and settle there and share with the petrodollars and the oil wealth of Saudi Arabia just because they're Muslim. Uh, there are people in Saudi Arabia who are Saudis. They have their problems, many problems, and they need your prayers and they need your pressure to get the situation better. But that's totally different. For Palestinian Arabs, what we didn't realize was that Jews were coming from Europe 
and other places and trying to get more and more of the land of Palestine to make it a Jewish place. And the Arabs didn't like that, of course. We were going to become a minority in our own homeland. And especially once the Holocaust took place and a lot of Jews gathered there, uh, the United Nations said, why don't we give the Jews all this area which is white and leave the green area for the Arabs? And the Arabs says, no, you can't take half of my land and give it to somebody else, to these uh, recent immigrants. You know, we like our Jewish neighbors, we have no problems, but this Zionist movement that is trying to take over our houses, we really don't accept. What we didn't know is that the entire world, having just fought World War II, having just gone through that experience, were more than willing to help the Jews fight for and take a big, huge chunk out of Palestine. So in 1948, not only did they take this white area, they even took a lot more and ended up with 78% of Palestine in their hands. And most of the Palestinian Arabs were kicked out of Palestine and became refugees. Now, this is very important because in 1967, another war took place, which Israel also won decisively and captured the rest of Palestine as well as the Sinai Peninsula, as well as a chunk of the Golan and became not just the modern day state of Israel, but also captured the West Bank and Gaza. Unlike 1948, the majority of the Palestinian people stayed put on their land. Some of them did leave and were not allowed to go back, but the majority stayed there. And so many people throughout the world, in fact, all the countries of the world said, Whatever happened in 48 and whatever happened in 67, this area, this white area, known as the West Bank and Gaza, is not part of Israel. It's occupied land. And Israel should give it back. However, this is a wonderful opportunity to solve the problem once and for all. If the Arabs are willing to accept, to give up their claim to 78% of Palestine, we can have a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. This is the so-called land for peace formula. Otherwise called the two-state formula. That you have a Jewish state and an Arab state in Palestine. And while that was not completely fair, still it made a lot of sense. And for many people, myself included, if we really want to have peace, the two-state solution seemed the best possible solution. And so people started working to try and make this happen. However, <laughs> the Zionists in Israel had a totally different idea. They said, this is our chance to take and keep all of Palestine. So they started putting up, you see these blue dots? They started putting up purely Jewish settlements throughout the occupied territories. These were not Israeli settlements because Israeli Arabs were not welcome or allowed to live there. These were areas just for Jews. And they took land under a number of different tricks and excuses. Uh, but the only idea was we want to control this land on behalf of Jews forever. Well, what do you do with the population that continued to live here? Well, 
you rule them under military rule. You keep things going while you take more and more land and settle more and more Jews into these areas. You start a peace process that goes on and on and on without any result. But eventually, you're going to keep all this area. Next month, this occupation will be 50 years old. It's no longer a temporary state of affairs. Already there are 500,000 Jewish people living in the occupied territories. Not only are they living in small, isolated dots, to the contrary, they are expanding so that all this yellow area that you see is no longer open to the Arabs. It's restricted only for the Jewish settlers. If we get the map here, if this was the Arab area, the Jews were taking so many parts of it that only the green area remains supposedly to be a Palestinian state. Now, if that does not work, if we no longer can have a two-state solution, what can we have? What is the answer? More importantly, what can we do about it? Steve spent uh, some time telling you about his own personal experience. So I want to tell you a little bit about my own personal experience. As a Palestinian Christian who grew up around that time, I was a teenager when the Six Day War started and the occupation began, and I felt I need to do something about it. I want to be free. I want to be independent and I want to defend myself and my country and my people. But I'm a Christian. And as a Christian I grew up thinking, you know, we try to stay away from politics, right? Because that's of the world. I want to stay away from politics, but politics doesn't stay away from me. <laughs> My very presence there as a non-Jew in an area that they're trying to make just for Jews is a political fact. I also grew up believing that as Christian followers of Christ, we're supposed to love our enemies, not kill them. But how can I, how can I love my enemy and still stick a knife in his back and shoot him? I can't very well do that. I can't very well do that. So, as a Palestinian and as a Christian, I am faced with a situation where the settlers are daily taking more and more of my land and daily oppressing and making my life miserable. I also had to deal with the Christian Zionist thing. And I don't know if any of you are, uh, grew up with that theology or continue to believe some of it. But there were people who told us that, well, of course, God gave this land to the Jews. And the Jews are the chosen people. And this is part of God's plan for history and part of the second coming. And I said, well, what does that mean? Where do I fit in? Am I not a child of God? Doesn't God love me? Is God really into that kind of territorial and tribal view? One of the things I loved about my Christian faith was that it is open. It is universal. That anybody can believe in Jesus and become a son of God. Not just one people. That God is the God of the whole universe, not just of a particular 
piece of land. And that God is a God of justice, who believes in fairness and equality, not in discrimination. And you see, Palestinian Christians got together and decided, what do we do about this occupation? And they came up with a document called the Kairos Palestine document. I don't know if there is, there's maybe even one copy of it left in the back, but you can really get it online. It's a document that was inspired by the Kairos South Africa document. How do we as Christians deal with a situation like this? And an amazing thing happened. All the Christian denominations agreed on that document. Now, Christians don't usually agree on anything. <laughs> but you found everybody from Catholics to Orthodox to uh, Evangelicals and Protestants and Armenians signed off on this document. And the other amazing thing is that that document said that as followers of Jesus Christ, we reject racism and discrimination, we believe in justice, but we also believe in non-violence. We need to oppose this oppression, but not by killing and fighting and shooting, but we must find a non-violent way to respond to it. Now, you men and I should appreciate this, because except for the early church, the majority of Christians in every single country have always found a nice excuse, a nice way to justify killing other people. Just war theory and uh, self-defense and obeying the powers that be. The exception is modern Palestinian Christians. With the majority of them says, no, 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 we don't, we understand Jesus' teaching to prohibit us from killing other people, even in self-defense. So what do we do? Well, we have to seek other methods. Maybe boycotts, maybe divestment, maybe sanctions, use international law to stop the crimes against humanity and the war crimes that were being committed against us. So the Christians unanimously endorsed the idea of BDS, boycotts, sanctions, and divestment. And he said, we cannot do this alone. We need the help of our Christian brothers and sisters in the West. And who would be the best people who would support us in this? Of course, Mennonites. They're a peace church. They really know about this stuff. They don't believe in violence. Uh, maybe they will support us. So when the issue came up in Kansas, uh, we expected really total support and were a little bit disappointed that the whole issue was basically tabled till the next uh, convention. However, a lot of people decided, okay, we want to study this matter, we will study this matter. And as part of the study, and discernment, uh, a new resolution came up, which talks about using uh, economic power, which talked about supporting those who believe in nonviolence on both sides, and which talked about the evil of anti-Semitism, as well as the evil of Islamophobia that the Christian position should really address all these issues. And so uh, perhaps our presence here tonight is part of that campaign and part of the planning for the next conference you will be having in Florida. Every church will be sending delegates, right? So we would like to talk to your delegates and we would like you guys to talk to other delegates as well, so that this time we pass the right resolution on these issues. And the matter is really a very important one. It has to do with what we believe in. 
Forget what's the ultimately the best solution. We could talk about that if you wish. But the question is, what is the role of Christians in this conflict? Is the role to send more weapons? Or is the role to work for peace in other ways? Is the role to close our eyes and pretend it doesn't happen? Or are we called to do something about it? Is the role to support the victims of anti-Semitism and of the Holocaust, regardless of what they're doing, and allow them to do evil to other people? Or is the role to really understand that our opposition to anti-Semitism and to racism and to discrimination and to Islamophobia also includes working for justice and working for a just solution. I'm, I'm always impressed that uh, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. Peacekeepers are people who want to keep everything quiet the way it is. Don't rock the boat. Don't disturb the situation. The situation right there requires somebody to disturb it. It's a very evil and oppressive situation. Today in the land of Palestine, if we can look at it, there's really two people living side by side. Not just one people. Steve here said that we used to be blind of the existence of the Palestinian people. And maybe we Palestinians were blind to what was happening to Jews in Europe and elsewhere. But the reality that today, this land has two people living in it. There's five or six million Jews who have all the power, who can live anywhere they want, who can do what they want. But there's another people, the Palestinian Arab people. And they're living in very miserable conditions. They don't have the rights. They don't have the ability to rule themselves. They don't have access to their own resources. The majority of them are exiled and cannot even return to their homes. Some of them, like people in Gaza, are living in absolutely miserable conditions. There's two million people living in this small piece of land. If you can imagine, let's see, let me show you. This Gaza, the most important thing about it is the scale of the map. It's 20 miles long and between two and five miles wide. And it has two million people living there. Crammed in there. They can't, their water, 95% of their water cannot be drunk because the Israelis have intercepted the water aquifer up here. So they can, don't have good drinking water. They don't have electricity because Israel controls how much fuel is allowed into Gaza. So they only have four to six hours every day. Israel controls all the borders and the sea, including the border with, with Egypt, where they have a special agreement not to allow anything there. They control how much food is allowed into that area or is allowed to be exported from that area. In fact, they calculate how many calories people need to be on a very strict diet. So they don't starve, they don't die, but they will have enough food to just barely survive. This kind of miserable existence with planes and drones constantly flying over and every once in a while dropping bombs or rockets on them. You know, people like to talk about rockets coming from Hamas on Israel. For every rocket that goes, there's about a thousand that come in the opposite direction. And while there may be a question of who started which barrage, there is no question that Israel controls that area 
completely from the air, from the ground, and from the sea. It's a miserable existence. We just have to remember, these are also human beings that are born in the image of God and that need to be respected. My time is running short, but I want to end by saying that the call for us, for Christians and for Mennonites and for people of goodwill, is not to support one side or the other, but to support the demands of justice. To always oppose racism, discrimination, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia equally. To always be very suspicious when claims are made in the name of one group at the expense of others and to always promote respect for human rights, human dignity, and, and human existence. And never, ever to support a violent response to that situation, which cannot be solved by violence, but only by nonviolent means. Thank you very much. I'm sure and I attend here. I have a question for uh, Jonathan, and that is your own experience. Um, in other words, can you go where you want to, being not uh, you know, you're, you're, you're okay. Christian rather than uh, Arab, or let's say no, than what, Muslim? Sorry. What determines where I can go and come is not whether I'm a Christian or a Muslim. Israel has divided Palestinians into five categories. And each category has a different rule. For example, some of my families, they're Christians, are prohibited from coming in. They don't have status. They have lost their status. They either happen to be outside, they had an identity card. My sister, uh, Jonathan Brenneman's uh, mother, had an identity card, but the Israelis took it away from her. So she has no right to go there, except as a tourist, she may be allowed and may not be allowed. Jonathan himself is not allowed. So that's one group. Another group living in Gaza, again, some of them are Christians and some are Muslims. They can go anywhere, in or out, without permission from the Israelis, and the Israelis don't give those permissions easily. Another group, those who are in the West Bank, usually can travel through Jordan, but again, if the Israelis allow them. If their name is on a list, they may not be allowed uh, to leave. I am in group number two here. I am an East Jerusalemites. East Jerusalemites are allowed to travel. Again, whether they are Muslim or Christians, but if they leave Jerusalem, for an extended period, like my sister, they lose their status. And they become like the refugees with no right. The best, the best group are the Israeli citizens, of, uh, the Palestinian citizens of Israel, mostly living in Nazareth and the Galilee. There's about 1.9 million of them. They are Israeli citizens. They can vote in the election of the Knesset, but they really have no political power and no political rights because the Israelis don't allow them in government positions. Israel doesn't have a two-party system. They always have coalitions. And uh, the coalitions have agreed among themselves not to ever allow the Arabs to be part of the coalition, whether it's right-wing or left-wing government. They are told that Israel is a Jewish state. It's not a state for its citizens. And if you're not Jewish, if you're Christian like me, uh, this is not your state. You, you are tolerated, you can live there, but you don't have political rights and political power. Uh, most of the Palestinians that I've met are wonderful people uh, like you, Mr. Pratet. Uh, one of the heartaches, it seems to me, for the Palestinian people 
is it they end up with such terrible, corrupt leadership? Uh, Yasser Arafat was a terribly corrupt leader. And it's such a heartache when there's so many wonderful Palestinian people. Why do those, and uh, Steve referenced the uh, uh, Oslo Accords at the beginning of the 90s, at the end of the 90s, uh, Yasser Arafat was standing with David Barak at Camp David with quite an attractive peace proposal that he walked away from. Okay. Oh it's hard for us here to understand. Okay, two, two reasons. First, the Camp David was not a very attractive offer. Uh, that is part of the myth that has been spread around again and again. Ehud Barak did not give an attractive offer to Yasser Arafat. Uh, nobody knows what are the actual details of what offer was made. And Arafat was very specific that the offer was not good enough and don't force us to deal with it because then we'll get blamed. He was assured that they will not be blamed, but we were blamed. But that's not the point. The point is that the Palestinian people have been dealt a very, very difficult hand. Yes, we have problems with leaders, but we as a people have rights which should be respected. People sometimes choose bad leaders. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean that their rights should be taken away because they elect the wrong people. In, in, in Gaza, 50% of the people chose Hamas in open and fair elections. And Israel decided to punish the entire Hamas strip for what 51% of them voted for when the others voted for Fatah, who are closer to the, the, the leadership of, of uh, Fatah, who are closer to uh, dealing with uh, Israel than Hamas is. The problem, I think, is only partly a problem of leadership. It's a problem of a system that tries to deny Palestinians self-determination. If people are given the chance to participate in their lives, restriction on movement have nothing to do with leadership. They have to do with what the Israelis control, prevention of uh, imports and exports. Uh, land ownership, when they come and seize our land, has nothing to do with whether our leaders are good or bad. It has to do with the fact that they want that land and they want it for Jews and for Jews only. Uh, so that Yasser Arafat, they were, we were told he's not a good leader, he has a beard, he doesn't look good, he doesn't speak English well, uh, he stutters, uh, he's not trustworthy. So we get another leader called Mahmoud Abbas who believes in peaceful ways, who dresses nicely with a suit, and who speaks English, and who looks grandfatherly. But he's getting us nowhere because Netanyahu is not willing to give anything to the Palestinian people. Right now we are told you should start negotiations again. And probably Mahmoud Abbas will agree to have negotiations again. But the question is that more and more land is being taken. More and more settlements are being built. And, and Mahmoud Abbas is doing nothing and can do nothing to prevent this expansion of settlements. And unless somebody can tell the Israelis to stop expanding the settlements, can tell Israel that this type of system where one side has one set of laws and another side has another set of laws, is not acceptable. It has a name, it's called apartheid. These, in these settlements, not only do they have separate places to live in, they even have separate roads that are for Jews only. They have separate court system. They have separate laws that apply to each group. They have one group that has access to the water resources, and has swimming pools, and another group that cannot, is not allowed to even dig their own wells to get water for themselves. Uh, they have a separate educational system, a separate health system, a separate uh, social uh, welfare system. They are living as separate group 
while the other group is living under military occupation, they can be arrested and put in jail, no questions asked, administrative detainees. So this kind of imbalance that exists in rights has nothing to do with whether you have good leaders or bad leaders. Uh, I, I, I agree, we would like to have better leaders. The problem is we can't even have votes. We, are, we can't even have elections to change the new leaders and to get a new crop. And if a good leader comes up, we don't know what Israel will do to them. Mm. My, my own uh, cousin, Mubarak Awad, during the first intifada, said we need to use non-violence. So during the intifada, he went around preaching to everybody, non-violence is the way. We should not use weapons. We should not even throw stones. And the Israelis took him and deported him. So the question is not just a question of leadership. It's a question of systematic injustice. Can you tell us, of course you can, how many Palestinians are living in the West Bank? Yeah, <coughs> actually we know. There's close to three million people living in the West Bank, about two million living in the Gaza Strip, and about 1.9 million uh, who are Israeli Arabs, who are citizens of Israel. Uh, the number of Jews in Israel is about six and a half million uh, Jews. By the way, the Israeli census includes all the Jewish settlers as part of the population of Israel, but doesn't include the Arabs living in those areas. And how many refugees? Oh, the refugees, we don't have exact numbers, but there's another five or six million uh, Palestinian refugees living outside of Palestine. Um, my name is John Bertie. Um, I have read a uh, Jewish writer had once said that Israel has four options. The first option is to do ethnic cleansing and be a criminal state. Secondly, is to have apartheid and be a morally uh, errant state. Third, they would do away with all borders, make all people equal citizens. Or the fourth one to be established borders, presumably on the 67 boundary and have a two-state solution. And I think the point is that if Israel continues as it is now, it is not in Israel's best interest to continue operating as they are now. I think that's very true. And I think that many people who like Israel will tell it. Its friends will tell it, you can't continue in this uh, route forever. The problem is that they think they can. They think that as long as the United States is willing to support them, it doesn't matter whether they are called apartheid or not, they will not have any sanctions against them. The United Nations will not act against them because the U.S. will veto any resolution. The International Court of Justice will not be allowed to act against them because the U.S. will throw its way to prevent that. FIFA, the World Soccer Organization, uh, had had to deal with this problem recently. And under tremendous U.S. pressure, they postponed it for another year. Because five of the groups in the Israeli League are from settlers. Under FIFA's own rules, you can't have settlers from outside the state of Israel, basically from the Palestinian areas, play in the Israeli uh, team. And so FIFA has threatened to kick Israel out of the, the soccer organization, but they think they can get away with it. And as long as they think they can get away with it, they are not willing to give up their uh, privilege. You want to address that? No. <laughs> no, I, 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 I just I, I agree with what there's a sense that this status quo can continue, uh, especially right now. I feel like there's this sort of detente, and it's seen as suboptimal but tolerable amongst um, members of the Israeli voting populace. 
And this is for Steve. So why don't you want to talk about this with your parents? And a lot of people talk yeah. about this. Honestly, it's, it's sort of a, there's. It's a, I don't really think they'll be hostile to it actually at all. Um, there is within the American Jewish community a very powerful story that Israel is the solution to the Holocaust. That and which is which is in of itself this incredibly powerful moment, both symbolically and materially, right? A lot of people die. Um, most American Jews are from Eastern Europe, are Ashkenazim, like me. And even people like my family who came here 45 years before the crap at the fan, you know, these are my grandparents' first cousins, right? We're, we're ended up in ditches. And if you come out critical of Israel saying that there's a fundamental problem with Israel being a Jewish state, that is a particularly incendiary statement. I use this analogy. It's not something that comes up within uh, faith communities. Um, I use this analogy uh, when we spoke yesterday at, at uh, First Men Night in Urbana, but it's like talking, if, if a rabbi were to go up and they'd either say that he supported BDS or did not support BDS, it'd be like he or she, I should say. It'd be like, it's like bringing up your like uncle's messy divorce on Thanksgiving. Like everyone has an opinion about it. Everyone knows everyone's opinion about it. Everyone knows <laughs> everyone else's opinions, but no one brings it up because they know if they do, Thanksgiving dinner will be ruined. And particularly the stance of BDS is, is yeah, I mean, I'm keeping myself out. It's really incendiary. It runs the risk of being very incendiary. So I think. It's just airing on the side of caution. I actually do need to say that because I think my name's going to end up in the paper soon. <laughs> and I know they Google my name occasionally to make sure that I'm not getting arrested. Um, <laughs> jokes, but uh, I, do, I do know they Google. So they're they're going to know. So that is, is that a sufficient answer? We can put it on Facebook if you like. Yeah, you should actually see if you can buy an ad and try to friend my parents. My dad's one. My name is Roger Clemens. Uh, all my life I've heard about a two-state solution to this problem. And I look at your map, the one on the right. Do you think that two-state solution still has any viability? Is it Israel going to annex that ground at some point when they feel like they can control it? And I think the other question is, will there be other uprisings against Israel? Uh, the first question, I'm very sorry to say, I don't think the two-state solution has any more viability. And I'm saying that with a heavy heart. Because I am one person who has worked very hard for a two-state solution. Even before that became the accepted position by most Palestinians and by all the Arab countries. And the reason why it cannot happen anymore is because Facts have been created on the ground. Not only physically, you have 500,000 people who are living in the occupied territories today. And Israel has been unwilling and perhaps unable to prevent the further expansion, to freeze the settlements. And not just the settlements, but also the outposts. You must understand what these outposts are. There's over 90 outposts in Israel today. They started when uh, Ariel Sharon told the young people, look, look, you guys, we're about to have peace. Hurry up. Before peace comes, grab any hilltop you see. Literally go and settle in it. And they did. And these hilltop youth would just grab land without even trying to pretend that it was properly confiscated. And they just set up quickly and the army would come and provide them with generators and, and with water and start building a perimeter around it to defend them, obviously, from terrorists and others who may 
attack them. And pretty soon they need also roads leading up to them. And pretty soon they have uh, services and electricity. And they start expanding. These are outposts that the Israeli government itself hasn't sanctioned. So much of the discussion in Israel is between legal and illegal settlements when international law says all settlements are illegal. Uh, so now there are so many facts on the ground. There's 500,000 people who will need to be uprooted and, and nobody's even talking about really seriously doing that. There's a psychological and administrative and legal system that is impossible to reverse. That is what forces us to start thinking in other terms. You know, because a two-state solution basically requires that you evacuate all the settlers and you allow the Palestinians to have a state with Gaza and the West Bank connected, uh, maybe demilitarized, maybe some form of sharing of Jerusalem, some limited return of refugees. That's the two-state solution. And for, as I said, for 50 years, that's what people of goodwill thought is, is the best chance for peace. Now that has been undermined, not by the Arab or the Palestinian side, but by the Israeli side. And now we are left with, where do we go from here? Uh, we have the options that you talked about, and the option that is right now operational is that you have basically one state here. If you look at any Israeli maps today, you will not see the 67 line at all. You'll see a map of all of Israel because they want to keep it all. Is the, uh, if I could ask a question then, is there a unified focus to the, and I always forget the three, the divest, boycott, and sanction. 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 Is there a, a unified goal, uh, an outcome that is yeah. is expressed? Uh, actually, actually, no. Uh, BDS is is a tactic. It's it's a commitment to use nonviolence and to use international pressure and to use international sanctions and boycotts. Uh, however, when pushed to give a political view, they said, okay, we want three things. We believe in the right of return for Palestinians. We believe in an end to the occupation. And we believe in equality for Jews and Arabs in Israel. This is the official political position. For me, what is most attractive about BDS is that it is a non-violent tactic. Their insistence that you cannot use force. I know uh, we have been told many times, why don't Palestinians use non-violence? Why don't they learn from Gandhi and Martin Luther King? Yes, we have. <laughs> We've learned. That's what we want to do. And now Israel is saying, ooh, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. Uh, BDS is the new demon uh, for Israeli uh, foreign policy. I'd just like to say that <clears throat> Jewish Voice for Peace's official reasoning and end of, of BDS is exactly the three points that Dr. Kahn just said. So there is, it's with JBP, it's the same position. Okay. Uh, Meredith, I'm going to have you ask a question, and then we're at an hour and 10 minutes, and typically we go an hour, hour and 15 minutes, but there's nothing that says we have to lock down the building, but some of you may want to be able to politely leave if you are coming on that timetable. So uh, I'd like you to ask your question and have an answer, and then I want to call a little bit of attention to some of the materials there, and then we'll close. Does that? Um, the uh, BDS movement, is being opposed now by a movement in the state legislatures, mm -hmm. and it um, it succeeded. This movement succeeded in California, and we were just in Minnesota when it succeeded in Minnesota. And uh, it succeeds because um, the uh, boycott 
divestment and sanction movement is presented as a form of discrimination against Israel. Now, how can we fight that movement so that BDS remains a viable option? Okay. Uh, I know how it is presented. It's presented as discrimination against Israel. It's presented as being anti-Semitic. Uh, it's presented as uh, economic terrorism. <laughs> that this is a way to destroy the state of Israel. Uh, and uh, the question is not how it is being presented. But what does it do? It does oppose the policies of the state of Israel. In that sense, it is the actions of the State of Israel that delegitimizes Israel, not BDS. BDS certainly calls attention to these things, and those who have answered the call of BDS and who have boycotted usually are also boycotting other people who are involved in the arms industries, who are human rights violators in other parts of the world. So it's not just against those who follow uh, boycotts as a method. Those who divest evidence, for example, for the Mennonites, already, without BDS, was already disinvesting and not investing in industries that have to do with military, that have to do with human rights violations, that are involved in things that are morally uh, repugnant. So we cannot prevent other people from saying whatever they want to say. We need to be, however, clear about where we stand. And, and I stand here to tell you very clearly, one of the most clear statements of BDS is rejection of racism, rejection of anti-Jewish uh, discrimination, anti-Semitism, as well as rejection of Islamophobia. Now, if in your mind, anything that the State of Israel does belongs to all the Jews, and any opposition to the State of Israel is opposition to all the Jews and anti-Semitism, then, yeah, you would conclude that this movement is anti-Semitic and discriminatory. That's why we are so pleased when Jewish Voice for Peace and others in Israel and outside tell you that as Jews, they feel uncomfortable with Israel's violation of Palestinian rights and they must put an end to them. Now, how do you put an end to them? Violently or non-violently? Do you oppose them by picking up the gun or do you oppose them by calling for boycotts, divestments and sanctions? And when I say sanctions, I mean we have to use international law against war criminals and against crimes against humanity which are taking place today in Syria. There are war criminals. In, in South Sudan, there are war criminals. And they should not be exempted from the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. So why should Israel be exempted? It's, you know, when we talk about sanctions, we talk about violations of international law across the world by any country. I think, <coughs> in conclusion, I think one, there's a narrative that a lot of this plays into what I would call like Zionist anti-Semitism. Uh, there's recent news, Tom Cotton, senator from Arkansas, making comments about how Jews in diaspora are all spies for the state of Israel. A lot of these people serving on state legislatures just see Jews as magical and religious elves and not actual real breathing people that actually have a very wide, diverse range of opinions on Israeli politics, both outside of Israel and within it. Um, and as someone who lived in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and was heavily involved in Jewish life there, it's also, this is, you know, the center, one of the centers of evangelical Christianity in America. Uh, and this is the things you, you would hear were baffling. And I, I don't, I think, in some ways, I, I don't, like, I don't want to give, like, lazy boy seat-back opinions, but in some ways it almost reads like overcompensating to me from white Christian elected officials in the United States. Um, that there's a lack of, that the only thing they see as anti-Semitism is criticism of Israel. And I think in conclusion, there's, there's a lot, you know, when you start to see 
recent turn of events in world politics I and mean, in US politics have sort of brought this to light when you see people like Richard Spencer, who's a neo-Nazi, criticized, uh, supporting and vo vocalizing support for mm -hmm. Zionist rabbinical figures, mm -hmm. you start to, you start to, you know, the, the light bulb starts to turn on. Mm -hmm. So, that being so. Yeah, the, 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 last, sorry, the last speaker uh, from Jewish Voice for Peace, Benjamin, was talking about how can you have somebody like uh, Bannon in the White House? Uh, how come people are quiet about Trump's own uh, anti-Semitism and his close circle of people? Uh, as long as they are supportive of Israel, they feel comfortable about allowing and being quiet about their anti-Semitism. And, and for me, at least speaking for myself, as a Christian, as a Palestinian, when I see that type of anti-Semitism, I have to speak out against it. The issue is not, are you supportive of Palestinians or not? If, if, if you don't like Jews, we don't need your help in the Palestinian cause. You need to repent from that sin and you need to change your behavior. Uh, and I'm not at all pleased that you happen to support Palestinians just because you hate Jews. This is not what, what, what we are about and not what we would like to see. I think we have had an exceptional evening and primarily because of your presentations and the variety of viewpoints and the nuance of it that uh, for me at least has just been uh, very, very helpful. Thank you for taking the time and trouble to, to be here with us.